Welcome to the Bath Studio School. I'm Henry James, a student, and I'm with Keith Phillips, a games developer. Um, I'm going to be asking him a couple of questions about the industry. Um, starting with, uh, how noticeable, in your opinion, is the improvement in computer graphics within the games industry? Well, obviously, the development of computer graphics is massive since I first started playing games. You know, it's just off the charts. Do you remember what it was like back, you know, in the 80s or the 90s? Um, even the 70s. Yeah. Playing um, Space Invaders, a little pixel beep, 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 beep across the screen. I remember the first thing I ever did was um, back at school, probably 1979, we had one computer in the entire school, and that was revolutionary. Wow. And I was the only student allowed to take it home, and it was huge. It was like this big and weighed a ton, and you plugged it into your home telly, um, and I designed um, a little shooting game with just a pixelated character, which was probably... 10 pixels, and you just sort of did, did, did a little one pixel bullet. And then now, you know, you've got photorealistic. So you've characters. been designing games since a very young age then? Yeah, yeah. Um, but oddly enough, I took a, uh, it sounds like I've been doing it, you know, for 30, 40, well, I don't know, for 40 years. But um, I started out being interested in computers. Um, and then I got a job in computers, and I graduated with a maths degree. Um, and then I got a job in software development in um, a company that worked did MOD contracts. And um, that just turned me off computers. <laughs> I hated computers after that. Um, and I got into uh, writing game books, which is like the choose your own adventure type thing. Mm. Um, and I kind of really just went off computers. Wouldn't get a mobile phone or anything like that for ages. Um, so. It wasn't, I, then I went into video editing, so a video production, video editing was my main skill, but video production um, um, stuff. So I've only really got back into games in the last two years. Wow. And was that in your free time or was that as an official job? That was an official job. So um, I got into the, from writing the game books, I got into filmmaking and doing it, because I'm really a te trained teacher, and I got into making um, film projects with, with young people. Um, and the funding started to trickle away for that, so we thought, right, let's do games. Um, so I got back into that kind of thing, um, not from the games angle, but from the teaching angle as something that I could teach students. So we have one game that we've, we've done now. Why did you uh, decide to go back into the games industry as a job? Like, why not go completely different and just like teach IT or whatever? Um, well, because it's boring. Um, <laughs> Yeah, teaching maths, teaching IT is horrible because the, the syllabus is a rubbish. I mean, they're, they're, the stuff that they get you to teach in maths is just nonsense that you're never going to use. You know, I, I go into a class and have to teach a subject and it's, um, you know, the, this is the first time I've seen it since I did it at GCSE. Well, I did O-levels, but... Yeah. And you think, what is the point of teaching this? But So, so you prefer the more practical kind of, you know, things you're actually going to use in your life. Yeah, and things that are going to be fun, and things that are going to give students real skills. So, like, when you do a subject uh, for an exam, you, are, you have to do it on your own, and you have to write the answers yourself. Mm. Um, that doesn't happen in the real world. You know, if you're working on a film project, if you're working on double glazing, whatever it is, you work as part of a team, and then you're just not allowed to do that. So I like to do the projects, the film projects, the games projects, where you're working as a team and students get to work as a team, um, and they develop those skills, and they produce something. All the projects I ever do, they produce something really good. So the film projects, we've got national and international awards, and now with the game projects, we've got the first game published, um, binary decoded, 4,000 downloads, and it looks fantastic, and it's a really good game, so. Perfect. Um... So in your free time, yeah. when you're not teaching students or helping or anything like that, um, do you actually play any games? Um, I don't have a TV, uh -huh. um, so one of the things I do mostly is play games um, right. on the iPad. So yeah, I'm just a, a terrible game addict and I play, my genre that I like is um, mostly point and click adventure games. So um, at the moment I'm playing The Witness, um, which is a very logical mathematical game, so that comes back to my mathematical skills. I'm, playing a lot of retro games because I didn't play so many games in the 90s and didn't yeah. get involved in it. I've gone back to all those games that people played in the 90s like um, Broken Sword, Monkey Island, those kinds of things and the, and the revamps with the better graphics. Um, yeah, so I play masses of, of those kinds of games, The Room. So the project that we are doing now, Carnival, mm -hmm. um, 
we had a donation, a massive donation from a company called Fireproof Games, who make a, a series of games called The Room, which are beautiful puzzle games. With, you know, they work much better on the iPad because you feel you, you weigh around the objects and you turn mm -hmm. things and stuff. So, yeah, I play a lot of games. And do you only really play mobile games then? No, a... no, I, um, mostly mobile because it's easier and you've got it wherever you go. But. I play games on the Mac as well, but I don't. I don't have a console or anything like that. I don't play any of those. Did you play games when um, when mobiles were really just becoming a thing? You know, in the 90s or early 2000s. Did you really play any mobile games? Like even back as early as Tetris. No, um, because as I said, I, I kind of after my experience of, of being a software developer, I just thought, no, ugh, you know, uh, technology. I don't like it. So I didn't really play those games. Having said that. Whilst I was writing the game books, um, the game books, I was able to, they, they gave me the, the money to be able to buy a laptop. And I did get addicted to Tetris on the laptop. I mean, seriously, I'd have to say, right, when I get to a score of 10,000 or whatever, I've got to stop, go back and do some writing. Yeah. So that was, you know. So have you noticed the, um, the change in graphics in mobile games, you know? Yeah, and yes. What effect do you really think that's had? Like, do you think that's um, increased the sales of mobile games, or do you think it's, you know, just one of those things. Um, I think, to me, the main thing that in improvements in graphics has brought, it enables artists to um, achieve their vision much better. So it doesn't mean necessarily that you've got photorealistic games or, um, you know, things that are really intricate. It means you have the potential to do whatever it is you want to do. So if you've got something really simple like um, Limbo, which is just p basically just black and white and stuff, but it's just realised you know, really beautifully. So the graphics enable artists, and I like to call the best game designers artists because mm. that's what they are. Um, um, it enables them to achieve their vision. So how, how important do you think it is with um, for artists or game designers to be um, creative over you know, just focusing on the money side of it? Um, I think it's vital. Um, I think the best way to be successful in any creative industry is to do what really drives you and then hope someone else, that's, you know, that other people like it. You have to just rely on that. If you, I think it's just soul destroying to do a job mm. where, you know, if you're going to do a job that you don't, where you're producing something you don't really like, be a plumber, you'll make more money. <laughs> Um, what about uh, the immersion side of games? How important do you think it is for games to become more immersive so people, you know, keep on playing it for the story sides of it or, you know, instead of just picking it up, putting it down, going back to it every, you know, few hours? I think it's crucial. Um, and not just the story side. Things like um, one of the brilliant games I play is, I don't know how to pronounce it, Botanicular or something like that, okay. and there's these little creatures, and they've got brilliant personalities. They, the little noises they make, and they. I, so I play that with my um, five-year-old niece, and um, there's one bit in it that she just. We just had to play that for five minutes. That one little bit, because it was just. She just loved it so much, and then we'd walk, be walking. So these little characters would come down. They go whoa all the time when they succeed in something, and she was doing that, you know. So it's that kind of characters that that I think are more immersive than stories. So with those characters, it would be, you know, they've obviously like hit the perfect area where, you know, um, children like your niece would be able to, you know, get with the the cartoonish graphics, but also, you know, the storyline of it, however simple, yeah. and all of that. Um, have you noticed any other major changes in the games industry since, you know, when it first started in the 80s? You know, anything else that really has yeah. allowed it to develop? I think the main thing is, is democratisation. So now you don't have to have a big studio to make a game. Um, anybody, so, I mean, we're only tiny. So anybody now who's got, who has the, um, the ideas and that uh, and the artistic skill can make a game because you've got things like Unity and Unreal, all those engines that can help you make games. Um, so all those things mean that, so like for instance, the Adobe Suite now has uh, motion capture. Sorry, I shouldn't call it motion capture because <laughs> the king of motion capture um, calls it performance capture because it's, right. you know, it's capturing a performance. It's not just motion, which is technical. Anyway, um, Andy Serkis I'm talking about. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. God, I know, what's his name? King Kong and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so you can do all those things, and there's there's tools that, that mean you that help you do the animation, um, publish the games. So I think the main thing is that you can get individual artists 
and small independent companies and they can make games that they're really passionate about, whether it takes them six months to make or seven years in some cases. So you're talking specifically about indie developers, aren't you? Yeah. As opposed to the mainstream developers like Ubisoft or EA, uh, EA sorry. Yeah. Or anything like that. Yeah. Do you think yeah. that those games, you know, um, obviously monetary-wise, they're not more successful, but do you think um, the style they are, the stories and everything like that, do you think it's better on indie games or...? Yeah, or? because I think one of the... Th it's better, not necessarily better, but it's better if you've got either one person, one artist, or a small team of artists with a vision that can produce something. I think that's where, where the best games come from, rather than the mass-produced, you know, first-person shooters or whatever, or platformers and stuff that, mm. you know, there's just a, a big yeah. kind of sausage factory. Yeah, and often recycling the same ideas every year or every yeah. few years. Yeah. Um, what would you say are the main features that clients look for in, ga in indie games, like the ones that you develop? Um, well, in indie games, I think what they're looking for is something, some kind of really individual thing. That So when you're looking through Steam or whatever for a game, you want something that visually or story-wise or whatever, it just immediately grabs you. So um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a, a game just released recently, a sort of a Frankenstein's game, which is really very individual look. Um, but mostly, I think, for games, indies or otherwise, what people are looking for is entertainment. Now, that sounds kind of trivial, but your entertainment can be at any level. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you're in, into literary fiction, your entertainment could be absolutely beautifully craft writing. And that's, but it's still your entertainment, mm -hmm. and literary fiction is a genre just like sci-fi or horror. Um, so what people, what people want is something that really engages them and gets them the immersion that you're talking about. Um, whatever that is for them individually. Yeah, I guess people often forget that, you know, um, computer games are part of the entertainment industry as yeah. a whole. Yeah. It's not just making money and yeah. all of that. Yeah, I think it, it can often come across as being, um, you know, the, the factory thing. It's just, you know, producing products for people, whereas, uh, you know, I, I'd like to think of it as kind of an art form. So the film industry, obviously, you know, you've got big and small, but you've still got artistic visions, and I think the same with the game industry. And that's what people want, I think. Uh, just delving slightly into the money side, mm. um, I'm not sure whether you'd know this or not, but uh, <clears throat> your first game, called Binary Decoded, yeah. um, how much money was it, roughly, do you know, that was put into developing that game? Um, well, the budget was 30,000-ish, okay. which some of it is in-kind support, so is the schools that we worked in, because Binary Decoded is a complete um, student project. So schools and that put in teacher time, room time, equipment time, um, and then we had funding from the Arts Council and the Swindon Borough Council and stuff like that. So that's 50-50 in kind of and mm. cash. So not a lot, but um, you know, obviously the people working on it, the young people, they were just doing it for the fun of it. Yeah, I mean paid. it's a drastic difference from you know Ubisoft's millions per game, yeah, or maybe even delving into the billions. Yeah. Um, so that money came from a variety of sources. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just one place, but it's still, you know, 30 grand is not much counting how much success you could really have from a game like that. Yeah, yeah. It, and it's, it's down, for a lot of the games, it's people really wanting to do it and doing it when they get home from work kind of thing, working on the artwork and the coding and that yeah, kind of stuff. Having so. a real love for the subject. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just one last question. Mm. Um, if you could summarise the changes in the games industry into a, one sentence or one paragraph, what would you summarise it as? Um, I don't know. Um, because I've already said it, really. I was, you know, the democratisation, the, the spread, mm -hmm. so the, and it's diversity, really. The games are taking over a lot of the, we, we were saying it, games are taking over a lot of the entertainment that people have. So um, I think it's just growing and, I don't know, um, I think one sentence is really hard. Yeah, I mean, uh, the democracy is what it sounds like. Yeah, I would say that, yeah, because um, in terms of, not just in terms of making games, but you can, because games is not a, um, a genre games is just a medium you know yeah. like film and films can be films tv series you've got you've got things from short films to films to massive long tv serials series that go on for, for years and years and years so i think the same with games 
games have something to offer anyone, whether you want to just fiddle about with Candy Crush or whether you want to pay, play, you know, um, Halo for mm. years and years and years. Perfect. Um, thank you, Keith Phillips. So um, that was Keith Phillips, part of. Um, so, what company is it that you Digital work Rights. Digital Rights. Spelt W R I T E S, which is annoying. I'm going to change it. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for your time, uh, Keith Phillips and Henry James. Um, hopefully, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>